Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. The show you are watching is the state of the state of Hawaii. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoltalton. Today we discuss how Hawaii's elementary and sec secondary education program is uh, unique. In all among all of the U.S. states, and we have an expert guest here, Sherry mm -hmm. Nakamura, uh, to to talk about this and discuss it and do a little analysis and tell us uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages so of our unique status in education. So she is the director of Hei, the Hui for Excellence in Education. So welcome, Sherry, to Think Tech. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for taking the time. Well, you know, I understand uh, that the Hei Coalition, um, if you do call it the coalition, um, yes, you can clarify that, um, follows um, the Department of Education and observes how it works for all the keikis in our state. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, about that and, and how it came to be that. Sure. So uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, people may remember furlough Fridays. That happened after the uh, Great Recession of 2008. Uh, our state was um, impacted as uh, tourists didn't come uh, because of the recession and consequently our general funds uh, decreased um, and we didn't have enough funds to um, service public schools as we had expected. So a decision was made by the Board of Education and the department in conjunction with the governor, I believe. And uh, it was decided that there would be 17 days of furloughs on Fridays. Now, you can imagine parents and community members were quite surprised to hear that, you know, 17 days would be uh, taken away from uh, students and uh, teachers. And so, um, there was a lot of running around by parents to figure out how to maybe change that decision. But uh, it seemed like people didn't really know how uh, things operated and who made, who made these decisions. And so uh, after this uh, decision was made, um, there were members of the community who felt that it might be useful to have a collective group of community members, maybe parent groups who could uh, keep tabs on what was going on so that next time there would be a way to uh, have a voice. And uh, so hey, a coalition was formed. Uh, I've been the director since its inception in 2010. And I am the representative of community organizations that are members of my HUI or, or the HUI. And um, I follow uh, Board of Education policy, the meetings. I go to all the Board of Ed meetings. And I also follow a uh, policy that's made at the legislature, the Hawaii State Legislature. And so we, I think we have consistently been providing a community voice to uh, decisions that are made. And I, I want to think that, you know, we've made a positive impact on uh, the shaping of education policy in Hawaii. Yes, let's let's hear about that. But I wanted to ask you how it is that you came into being. So did that require um, getting involved with the leaders, the, the uh, government leaders or the department? Or how did you actually get your charter to do uh, what you're doing? Well, we were sponsored by a nonprofit called the Learning Coalition, uh, whose mission is to engage community or connect community with public education. And uh, this seemed to be a uh, vehicle that was uh, needed at the time because of this furlough Friday uh, example that uh, the community really didn't have a way to um, you know, provide comment or give a voice. And so the Learning Coalition has uh, been a sponsor of Hei Coalition. And uh, I am, uh, have been put in charge to convene and manage the coalition. And I represent the voices of my community members. And we do have a governance structure. You know, we have a process by which uh, decisions are made. 
and I do convene uh, meetings. Actually, right now, since the pandemic, we've been convening every week, and we meet with uh, the Department of Education uh, uh, members. Um, I mean, there, there's somebody assigned to us, and we do have this dialogue with the department. And so we're extremely appreciative of the department's uh, cooperation and yes. uh, uh, collaboration with us. Yes, that's that's wonderful. I, I was wondering, are those uh, department officials that meet with you? Um, uh, they are uh, members of the Office of Strategy and Innovation and Performance, as well as the Community Engagement Branch. So they are sort of community liaisons. And uh, once again, we're, we're so appreciative that uh, we have the support of the department to be able to engage uh, and ask questions about you know what's going on, and it's been particularly um, you know with the pandemic, it's there's a lot of uh, things happening every day. So we 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 want to be able to know what's happening, and and we want to know how we can help. And you also are present at the board meetings, and that's one place where I've I've seen you ask your questions and make your comments. So you're active uh, whenever. Sure of education as um, having hearings and I guess other, other governmental functions that you can maybe influence too with them. Yes, yeah, so I, I am a um, consistent member of the Board of Education meetings uh, when things come on the agenda and our coalition members want to give a comment, uh, we do submit testimony. And so I usually present both written and oral testimony. Um, but in addition to that, we also participate um, in um, initiatives that the department sponsors, uh, if they want a parent uh, voice or a community member voice, I'm often called to, you know, engage and participate in uh, work groups and such. So uh, we've had a long history of, of collaboration. At the same time, uh, sometimes uh, there are instances where we don't always uh, align with the department. And so, you know, we, we feel that um, we can be a critical friend sometimes and, uh, and say things that um, you know, we feel uh, we can contribute to or that you know, some of the members might have a difference in opinion. Yes, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. Quite a charge. <laughs> uh, I think that um, it also shows us how much is involved uh, in, in the in the Department of Education's policy making and operations, right? So um, how, how actually vast, I mean, how it involves so many different fact features of the government. But let me ask you, what do you need to know about the Department of Education in order to do uh, due diligence uh, with your work? What, what do you need to know uh -huh. about? And, and maybe uh, viewers are not really familiar with the structure of the department either or its organization. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Well, our state system is quite unique. In fact, it is unique. We are the only state, uh, one state, one district system in the nation. So on the mainland, or usually, uh, you will have a state and you will have many districts. And each district will have their own boards of education, their local board. There's also a state board of education. So uh, there are a lot of uh, administrators or policymakers, if you will, uh, uh, compared to us, we have one. We have one board of education and one department of education, even though we have uh, different islands and different communities. So in a sense, it is, you would think that it's quite efficient in that, you know, you only have to deal with one board meeting uh, or one board of education as opposed to many. Um, however, it is a large system. We're one of the top 10 largest districts in the nation. We have about 100, almost 180,000 students. We have, I think it's 13,000 teachers. And we have 294 schools or almost 300 schools if you count the public charter schools. So it's a massive system. And uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that while it is one system, we have many different kinds of communities. I would say that all the islands are different. Um, we have differences in so socioeconomic status amongst our uh, communities. 
uh, we have different ethnic groups. And so I think it's important to remember that we have a huge diversity here. And uh, how do we best use our one state system to be able to address the diversity uh, that our state um, uh, has? Uh, I think that's a big challenge. Uh, we're cognizant of it. And, um, you know, once again, as community members, we want to help as much as possible, uh, try to align uh, the policy making with the implementations that are happening at the schools. Well, yeah, that's a very, very uh, impressive description of our system um, that, that is overwhelmingly um, huge and diverse. And, um, and I think that uh, the department itself must understand that too, and probably has done things over time to, to address all of that uh, vari variability across our islands and in all of the different communities. So how, how does it, how has it addressed it and maybe broken down or, or regrouped uh, or reorganized to accommodate more? Well, I think it was 20 years ago. Um, well, I guess I should say um, uh, uh, um, 20 years ago, there was a act by the legislature that um, it was called Act 51, which sort of um, decentralized the system in a way uh, we were broken up into complexes so before that it used to be districts and i think those were more traditional you know when on oahu would be the windward district the central district uh the leeward district but uh, it was decided that uh, the regions would be broken up into complexes which follow high schools so we have and the reason for that is if it's a complex or an area of a high school, then you have the elementary, middle, and high aligned with that complex. So if it's uh, you know the, 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 the Farrington complex or the Kaiser complex, all of the elementary schools that feed into the middle school that feeds into the high school are aligned. And so they're organized in that way. Um, and each complex area um, has a superintendent. They're called a complex area superintendent. So there is a bit of, um, there was an attempt to try to uh, maintain the uniqueness of that particular complex or complex area based on the needs of the community. Meanwhile, we do still have a state office, um, which is sort of the leadership and the um, you know, the state administrators that sort of look at the overall uh, uh, operations of the state. So you have complexes in the schools aligned in K-12, and then you have state leadership, um, which provides, you know, curriculum support or facility support or, um, you know, IT and things like that. So it's a state administration and then a complex administration, and then you have the school administration. So it was broken up. Uh, in this fashion. Now, it has gone back and forth between, uh, I would say, a more uh, centralized system and a decentralized system. So I would say maybe two administrations ago, uh, we received a, a grant from uh, 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 the Race to the Top. It was a US DOE grant where uh, what you, 70, yeah. 70 some odd million and Hawaii was um, required to, you know, implement certain uh, initiatives. And because of that, uh, that administration took a more centralized approach since we had to get these uh, initiatives done to meet the needs of the, of the, of the grant. Um, but that has shifted a, from a more centralized approach to a decentralized approach to what is known as school empowerment. So this past administration uh, sort of shifted that uh, perspective and wanted to give more discretion and authority to the schools. Um, so it goes, it has gone back and forth from like a state focus and now maybe more of a 
school focus on, I don't know if it's top down, was more top down and now it's more bottom up. Um, I think my coalition members would agree that it probably would be best if it was a balance of both. That you do need to have some functions, uh, you know, kept at the state level um, while maintaining the flexibility at the school level or even the complex level uh, because you know all of our communities are different so it's a fine it's very difficult to find that ideal balance well as they seek it then you're talking about now it's partially bottom up top down is it i mean how much input and how do how does the public how do parents and those who have their children in the schools have how do they have any voice so maybe right right they- so i think most i think this is true everywhere if you have if you're a parent and you have a and you have children at a particular school or a child at a particular school you will advocate at the school level and there are mechanisms to do to do this uh, each school has what they call a school community council uh, it is a elected uh, group, though you can't, you can't just show up one day. I think there are uh, members, uh, designated members of the school community council, but there is a parent representative and there is a way that parents can participate in that process of being an advisor uh, to the principal. So parents often will be dealing directly with the school uh, where they're children are attending. Um, However, we are, as a coalition, a community coalition, are looking more at the policy or the uh, system level. And so consequently, we have parent groups who are part of our coalition. So if a parent is wanting to uh, understand more what's happening sort of at the 30,000 foot level, and wanting to make uh, an impact or uh, engage in what's going on at the policy level, um, you know, they can participate uh, in a parent group who is a part of our membership. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. The Hawaii State uh, PTSA is a member of HEA, and there is another group called Hawaii, or Parents for Public Schools Hawaii, which is also a member of HEA. And so through representation, they would be able to engage in some of the uh, commentary that we provide to the department. Now, but, did, you, uh, yeah. did this come about through hey, a and not there previously? So did you instantiate this way of being able to communicate? Uh, yes, I think so. I think that um, traditionally it was pretty much parents advocating at the school level but, and maybe the Hawaii State PTSA or, or parent groups might have on occasion, uh, you know, sent a comment to the Board of Education or the legislature, but I feel like um, HEA has provided a mechanism uh, to allow uh, broader community members to coalesce together and come to, you know, collective decisions about um, you know, what we feel is a, a comment from the community uh, to be able to communicate that to the department. Well, I'd like to move over and talk a little bit about the most popular topic, I think, <laughs> in this world, and, and certainly in education, but about the budget, the money. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. How does this uniqueness of Hawaii's elementary secondary school system uh, make that budgetary process equal, efficient, equitable, you know, address needs. So how does that work? Yes. So through this Act 51, uh, which was uh, enacted, um, I'm not quite sure, I think it was in the early 2000s, this concept of the weighted student formula, WSF is the acronym, was created. And basically, um, every student gets a base funding and then there is a weight added if for example a student is uh, economically disadvantaged or maybe an english learner or maybe a 
gifted and talented uh, or a, a student receiving a special education services. So um, it's per pupil and uh, it gets allocated across the state in this way. And people have uh, said that Hawaii's funding a formula or method of funding is probably one of the most equitable in the nation because um, on the mainland, uh, school funding is usually determined by property tax. So if you live in a district where it's an affluent district and where housing prices are high and there's going to be a tax, uh, those schools in that area will uh, be, get, receive the benefit of, of, of that um, high property tax uh, compared to another region that's um, uh, uh, a lower socioeconomic um, uh, status. So in Hawaii, it doesn't matter if you are in a more affluent district or a not that affluent district, uh, the student will get the same weighted student formula based on the makeup of, of the population of the school. And so in that sense, we are, our funding stream is equitable. That said, if you're in a, yeah, yes. know, if, you, if you go to an, uh, a school in an affluent area, perhaps, you know, the PTA or the Ohana group would be able to raise uh, additional monies uh, to supplement uh, the, the, the school budget. Um, but, but in terms of the state funding, uh, it is uh, said to be equitable. Now, on top of that, we do receive federal funding. So it's, I think it's a grant called Title I, where if there's a, if a school is, I think, 46% or some odd, uh, if it has a 46% um, of economically disadvantaged students, there is a formula to receive federal funding. So those schools get uh, additional funding to the state funding. And um, there's also additional grants, like the grants that are being discussed right now, uh, the ESSER funds, um, which right. are the funds to help uh, um, address the impacts of COVID-19. So, um, but generally this, in terms of state funding, it is pretty equitable. And then you have federal funding and maybe even special funding on top of that. Well, so that's, that's, yeah. that's informative because I think that what you're saying then is, is what this system makes efficient so that actually the state is accommodating every single student at the same level in the budgetary process, right? But then it there is. are factors that come in, especially the feds with the ESE, the Elementary Secondary Ed Act with the Title I. So those schools that have children who need those extra funds are gonna have more funding out of that source, which- Correct. Changes. Now, okay. one thing I would like to say um, is that in, looking at the weighted student formula and how things are allocated, how the funds are allocated, we do have quite a bit of um, small and rural schools. And for those schools, WSS, w, excuse me, WSF doesn't always uh, uh, work or is, is not necessarily beneficial to them because of their small population. So, oh. Because if you're a school with lots of students, you're gonna get a per pupil funding. So you're gonna get relatively more funds uh, compared to a school with a small population. So I did wanna mention that because it's something that I think gets overlooked sometimes um, because the smaller schools are small. Uh, there's not a lot of um, advocacy, you know, uh, from those schools just because there's not very many families. Um, and but I do know that those schools struggle. It's the rural and small schools, they struggle because oftentimes they don't have enough funds to staff appropriately. So I did okay. want to mention that uh, as a something to consider when it uh, in, in looking at our WSS system. Very clarifying. Yeah, that is very clarifying. And on the other side of that is the, the military reservations and the, um, the amount of funds that come in uh, to support the schools in those areas for those students. So that's well, an problem. Well, yes. Um, so the military, my understanding is there is, uh, it's called an impact fee. Um, and I think it's based on not necessarily military for personnel, but if uh, families uh, work for the federal government, the schools send out a survey and then they calculate uh, how many uh, 
federal employees there are, and the state gets um, uh, a funding stream uh, depending on the amount of, of people, of fam families or students. However, those funds can be used across all schools. It doesn't have to necessarily be military impacted schools. That said, perhaps if you're a school on a base, and I, and I don't want to misspeak, perhaps there are extra supports that the military provide, whether it's um, you know Department of Defense grants or um, I do I actually I do know that there are military parent liaisons that are funded by the Department of Defense, and they help service the military impacted schools. So th those schools do have that benefit. Um, as compared to the ones that are not military impacted. All right, anyway, anyway. So um, WSF, which you have uh, shared with us, means the, the weighted, weighted student formula. Uh -huh. WSF. And so we know a little bit about that now. But what I'm hearing um, then with the variability in the funding opportunities or options that come into certain schools, does the state do anything with its budget then to kind of ease, to, to get those wrinkles kind of even across the schools. Like like you mentioned, the rules are not uh, getting any special um, uh, flow of fundage. Does the state do anything to make up for that? Or how, how is that handled? Or what, what happens when something like that comes up? Is this the sort of thing Hey, a might address or? Yes, it would be something that Hey, a uh, could address. I know, so the state legislature, my understanding is the state legislature hasn't necessarily uh, put in a special allocation for small and rural funds. However, uh, the department has a committee on weights. So every couple of years, I think it is, there is a work group that reviews uh, the terms of the weighted student formula and makes recommendations to the board uh, there was a time when there was a special fund or there was a fund in which smaller schools could apply for a grant based on their need. I think that was removed at one time. Perhaps it's being put back. <laughs> so there is a mechanism, although uh, I think there's been some fluctuation as to you know, the amounts and, and to what extent a small school can apply. So it could be something that hey, hey could advocate for, for example, well, to the legislature if, if you know, to, to inquire whether or not something more permanent could be put into place just so that these schools, um, you know, could at least have uh, a, 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 the staff to be able to service kids in a, in a very quality way. So, like that that is an important intention well tell us now in this last minute or so remaining uh what what are hey A's, um uh goals um what what outcomes um have you achieved um through your your services and your your observations and um your work with the department of education what outcomes have you achieved and what are some that you look to and have um, achieved in the future? Well, uh, in the past, um, we have affected or um, created legislation uh, that um, has, you know, made an impact on the department. Uh, there was an instructional hour law uh, requirement uh, that was generated by parents. Um, and Hey supported that we weren't the parents were not part of Hey A at the time, but um, we did support that. Uh, there was a bill to um, increase the superintendent's salary, which, because we weren't competitive with other states, we helped advocate for that. At the board level, we've um, you know um, supported family engagement policies as well as. Um, uh, educational equity policies, we are really hoping, and this can be one of our objectives, um, we are striving for equity in education, which means uh, we want to be fighting for those students who don't usually have a voice, whether they are the economically disadvantaged, uh, the special education students, or the immigrant students, the English learner students. 
oftentimes uh, parents are working and they're not able to advocate directly for their, their children. And so we hope to fill that void. I think ultimately we wanna be a, uh, a partner, uh, a, a collaborator with the department. Uh, we feel that we have um, expertise within our coalition from the community. And I think we want to work together, but what that means is you know, two-way communication, uh, a mechanism by which you know our voices can be heard and and uh, supported, um, and so we keep striving for that kind of collaboration. And it's not just with the department; it's also with the board and the legislature, uh, because I think um, our community voice is uh, a, a factor uh, that should be considered. And uh, I think we keep moving forward to really help our students. And that's, that's really our goals. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it uh, sounds like it, you, you, you've got a, a path uh, forward to become stronger and, and, in, and more influential and in such a <laughs> way for this state to make it continue to be unique, but also to be uniquely successful. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's right. The diversity uh, that we have. So I thank you so much, Sherry, for coming in and providing um, this time to learn more about HAE, but certainly about the, uh, the state's Department of Education. Um, we don't get a chance to hear um, details, and, and you've provided those or to understand how it, how it really works and operates and develops policy. But um, I'm I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and you're watching the state of the state of Hawaii. And thank you, Sherry, uh, very much for this uh, show information. And I'll see you again in two weeks. And mahalo for your attention, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for having